The working classes have always, according to the different stages of development of society, lived in different circumstances and had different relations to their owning and ruling classes. In antiquity, the workers were the slaves of the owners, just as they still are in the many backward countries and even in the southern part of the United States. In the Middle Ages, they were, they were the serfs of the land-owning land -owning nobility, as they still are in Hungary, Poland, and Russia. In the Middle Ages, and, in, and indeed right up to the Industrial Revolution, there were also journeymen in the cities who worked in the service of the petty bourgeois masters. Gradually, as manufacturer developed, these journeymen became manufacturing workers who were even then employed by larger capitalists. Here we are in section 6, and this again is a wonderfully put together section here. What Engels perfectly captures here in this section is historical materialism and relations of production. I will refer to relations of production as ROP or ROP in the future, but most of the time you will just hear me say ROP. Anywho, of course, he brings up the biggest determining factor of how and what a working class will be in relationship to a ruling slash owning class of society. That very thing he hints at is material conditions of society. And that's our golden ticket, not our royal road, to understanding both social and economic relations, socio-economic relations, of the working class in relationship to the ruling slash owning classes of society. Yet Engels goes on from there and particularizes historical materialism by mentioning two universally dialectical negative stages of human society. Slave society, or antiquity, and feudal society, or the Middle Ages. And notably, Engels provides these two stages of human society as they are the most recorded, well, as recorded as they can be, and most affecting of human history as far as we know. There's a whole discussion of Asiatic modes of production, means of production, and relations to production that isn't really going to be covered here, but the thing for right now is that other, that third, for right now, of course. Get it back on track. Without either of them, feudal society and slave society, history, that being human history, would have resulted in a way different path than what we know of today, than what we have recorded so far, and what we could care for anyways. And that's factor in, in discussions about of how we can achieve the very same economic mode of productions that we have today, or even develop the same philosophies and ideologies that we are manifested in today, or are heavily influenced by such, even if they don't currently exist as such. Anywho, if, if slave society, antiquity, had it existed, then we would have, wouldn't have our most essential mode of production, human power, exist in the same force it as it has been for the past. And while human labor is less efficient than machines powered by either water or coal, you need human labor to exist to even actualize these post-seeding, or what will come after, modes of production. Thus, Engels states that backward countries and the United States of America South, or the South as it's called in the States, because they clearly show this stage is still present there, as in, as in the time as he was writing in the late to mid-1840s, of course. Yet, being crafty as he is, he makes distinct clarifications and particularizes the differing slave societies 
across time by stating one, a general set of countries yet not affected by capitalism properly, thus being called backward countries, and two, a part of the United States of America, the South, that is supporting capitalism's growth, be generally in the North, but there was some present during the 1840s, but not to the same extent as it was in the North, or even in the West, for that matter. With the power of human labor, that was solely human labor, and that manifested with either water power or steam power that is that is found in feudalism and capitalism respectively. But keep in mind the fact that I said a part of the USA is supporting capitalism's growth with slave labor. For if one were to study American history under a Marxist lens, they will know that differing bases of America, slave society and capitalist society, would come into fierce competition <coughs> to root the other out as to secure their own existence. That's why America will have a huge internal war during the 1860s. In fact, it was just called the Civil War. Which determined which base superstructure, which is short short-handed to social order for our sakes, will win out America's future between both a deadbeat past that was the Confederate States of America's slave society and the actualizing present that was the United States of America's capitalist society. Yet keep in mind while well, analyzing America and other countries that have this very similar problem, with the past and the future struggling to win over the present. In any case, for what we can respect in any fashion, the dialectic is in motion. Yes, in motion there, regardless of the fact that one's stuck in the past and one's approaching the future. I'm not going to pull out that casual quote. But, there, there's a quote. Actually, let me find it out right now. To quote Fidel Castro, A revolution is a struggle to the death between the future and the past. The American Civil War can be seen in that way that, despite the fact that capitalism was already established as such, and it was merely a struggle between the present and the past, America's future was on the line, and America's future decided to side with the present, that being capitalism over slave society. Thus, while the present was really struggling with the past, the alliance between the present and the future is what secured America's future away from a slave society. But now this is going heavily in the abstract and into the more idealistic indifference to the materialistic abstract or the actual abstract. But know for right now that the American Civil War, regardless of how you th how you think of it, including its terrible outcome of, you know, the ex-slaves, still allowed America to progress as such, to progress past slave society. And to get back on topic of, you know, societies not existing, or historical so stages not existing within human history, by that respect, if feudal society hadn't existed, then we wouldn't have the restructuring of human power into more efficient and tightly knit communities that later rose, that, that later a mode of production would rise that is referred nowadays as water power 
due to many guilds relying on water streams or water or rivers or whatever had a flowing source of water to power their own machines and then finally the last epoch of the feudal social order the mercantile feudal epoch as I call it that started to alleviate the growing contradictions between colonialism and feudalism but in that hypocrisy corroded feudalism as to grow colonialism unhindered which by that nature means that mercantilism was a means for feudalism and colonialism to interact and to compete with one another but ultimately letting society be able to make the tra transition out of the feudal social order to the capitalist social order as it finally developed far enough that revolutions can carry it forward to the next stage. In fact, if you ever studied your history just a little bit, you would know that the first advocates for the capitalist social order will be the plutocrats and the physiocrats, but more upon them later, of course, as this is going to be a growing trend of the more upon them later. Anywho, by that same token, it can then process and make better use of the colonies away from Europe to better itself and to start rapidly progressing the material conditions to give Europe the smoothest transition from feudalism into capitalism. Nothing happens immediately, there needs to be a medium, and mercantilism provided that very powerful medium a catalyst for capitalism to start growing, to give its own rise a meaning, to actualize capitalism's self-consciousness, which will be manifested, manifested under the will of capital. But more upon that later, of course. And yet, like into those backward societies in the American South, parts of Europe and the world as was being still under the feudal social order, of course engaged in the mercantile feudal epoch, but still under the universality of feudalism. Those being Austria, Hungary, Poland, and Russia for the parts of Europe under the feudal social order, of course in their own respective matters. One thing to mention right now actually is that Austria-Hungary would exist as a nation by the turn of the Austro-Prussian War of 1863 and not during the time when Engels was writing it and especially when it finally got published as such. Unless of course I'm getting my publishing dates wrong, but the fact of the matter remains that Austria or the Austrian Empire was the real empire at that time. Austria-Hungary will come later on, later down the road. Regardless, let's get in with the countries that I mentioned. Well, not really for one of them, because during the time when Engels was writing it, Poland wasn't a country. Poland by that point had been divided between Prussia, Austria, and Russia, thanks to the Polish Lithuanian partitions, but for that region overall, there was still a persisting feudal social order thanks to the contingent history denying them to move past such order, thanks to military conflict between the aligned despots of Prussia, Austria, and Russia, who wished for Poland to stay sick and divisible and conservative reactionaries still wanting to preserve their aristocratic freedoms that was within Poland and Lithuania. And those very same freedoms costed the legislative branch to be very inefficient to the point of a crawl and to block useful changes in society that can let it go back on the path of recovery and to become a 
a world power within Europe. One of those freedoms as such was the liberum veto, a literal translation from Latin being the free veto, which gave the aristocrats the power to bomb a congress. Not in the sense of destroying the congress, but ending the congress then and there and postponing it to another date. As they really didn't have a way to say nay in that essence. It's either that you agreed or you bombed the congress. And you only needed one liberum veto to just bomb the congress. There was no way to really discuss a act, a bill, or even a reform. It's either all agree with the conditions or you just bomb it outright. <coughs> Yet another important reform was the abolishment of ser serfdom, which made the government solely responsible for these freed serfs but added serve them as such, which was going against their freedoms, their aristocratic freedoms, because now it made the serfs not only protected by the government and not only free from these landlords, but equal to them, because they were given also the same rights as them during the Polish Constitution of the 3rd of May of 1791. With this very event, it gave the conservative reaction and the biggest push they could have because they were supported by the United Despots to restore power, but being the fools as they were, they only were concerned for their power and were willing to be compradors of other ruling nations that were surrounding Poland and Lithuania and willing to betray them as to secure their own power. And that's a common trend in history, that the ruling class will be willing to betray their own countries as long as the other country's ruling class is willing to back them up. This is going to be a very important trend later, as we see with the Commodore classes in colonial and imperialist nations, or nations subjected under the colonial and imperialist rule of other nations. Moving on, Hungary was in large parts also just another region, not a full fledgling country, albeit it was more of an autonomous region than a clearly carved up region between three countries. It was under one country, the Austrian Empire, but regardless, that region, that autonomous region, was in large parts still covering, despite being as such strong enough to challenge Austria, but they were still weakened by all the wars they participated with Austria, while not being able to economically progress further because they weren't able to necessarily hire the industrialists and buy industrial parts to industrialize their countries, which that wasn't prevented by Austria, that was, in large part, was collectively blocked by the conservative reactionaries and the guild societies in the cities to preserve their own economic well-being from a more radical, revolutionary, and more simplified ruling class of the bourgeoisie. Albeit, Austria-Hungary didn't well, sorry again with that Austria-Hungary mention. Austria did in fact want to make Hungary subservient to it. It was more concerned with making it politically subservient than being economically subservient, even though they wanted to make sure that Hungary as such wouldn't overcome them in the econ economic sector as well. For Russia, we can use the same Really not same explanation, but still the same explanation of conservative reactionaries to analyze Russia while understanding that the material conditions for it made it detrimentally slow to progress 
as such, thanks to its expansively huge size and existing inefficiencies of the of the government during Angle's times, to tap into the to the abundant resources in the countryside for its current social order. That's why later in the 1860s, Russia will be dominated in the Crimean War by industrial powers like Britain, France, and even their border rival, the Ottoman Empire, because they industrialized as Western powers. Okay, maybe not the Ottoman Empire, but clearly, both Britain and France were able to dominate Russia during the Crimean War while not able to take a lot of land that would, that would have penetrated into a huger sector of Russia, Western Russia, of course. But the matter of fact is that Britain and France were able to hold their ground despite being assaulted by massive waves of men that were sent in from the countryside of Russia to fight against them. The, and the lessons they learned from the Crimean War would force them to a painful transition from the field of social order, which by and large they were really a semi-feudal order, than a proper feudal order, regardless, from a feudal social order to a capitalist social order. But <coughs> they'll end up being a more social feudal order that had semi-capitalistic social order tendencies entering in the Great War, World War I, by that time, instead of finally becoming a capitalist social order, as they should have been during World War I. Now, of course, there's contingent history, histories of the fact that an assassination attempt was against Alexander the Second. He died. Alexander the Third sought the reforms, and really studied, you know, industrialization. But that's a whole other nightmare to talk about later. But which, mind you, because the fact that Russia was in a semi-feudal and a semi-capitalist social order instead of being a corrupted feudal social order by that time, even though there's really no difference between a corrupted and a regular social order, just one is in a more malaise, in a more decayed form, and the other is just a regular form, but going on, getting back on track, mind you, <coughs> if Russia wasn't able to achieve such social order, that being semi-feudal, semi-capitalist, it wouldn't be able to get on to this communist revolution that would have, that it would it would have had after the April Revolution, that being the bourgeois revolution by the Kerensky government. Albeit they may have been able to done it in an earlier time, like in 1905, the fact that the matter remains is that without capitalism being introduced in Russia, or being a threat to Russia in some aspects, because the people were being, let's just say, necessarily exploited in order to make capitalism, you know, function, which also happened to a lot of other industrial countries and industrializing countries. They had to have their working classes exploited and the old ruling classes being rooted out in order to make capitalism function, but to just end off the point with just a simple remark, no industrialization means no capitalism being present there, of course, which means no communist revolution happening. Now we can bicker on with how China might be an exception but I like to remind you that it was a semi-feudal and a semi-colonial, you know, state at that time. And it was happening during the presence of capitalism there. Capitalism by that time was already established in the world. <coughs> it had a solid foothold on the world. 
and there was already a growing proletarian, proletarian base happening there. And Mao was able to tap into that base, but Mao was also able to tap into the peasant base, and he was able to transform the peasant base into a more proletarian base later on in the revolution. The fact of the matter remains that the peasantry, when working with the proletarians to make a revolution, makes revolution possible. This is the same case that I followed in Russia, but at a more smaller scale. The peasantry was helping the proletarians, but for Russia, contingently, it was the proletarians that had the lead on the revolution. Albeit Mao didn't just simply let the peasants be as is. You know, he didn't just said, well, thank you for helping me, you can just stay as you are. No, he was transforming them along the way, but he was able to tap into their griefs and understand their griefs and weaponize their griefs into something that could help the revolution. But more upon that later. Yet of course, let's briefly go over the transition of guild laborers being journeymen or vagabonds to manufacturer workers. For the guild system had given its own death despite growing rapidly under the mercantile feudal epoch as it was becoming stale, stale with the lack of trade techniques and manufacturing techniques spreading around from the old generations to the new generations. And because of that, supply was still embarrassingly low and capital wasn't as developed as much. But for the capital that wasn't under the guys under the control of the guild system was self-determining its own future, its own reproduction, its own growth. And as such, because that free capital was determining its own future, it was going to seek its own routes of expansion to circumvent this guild system which ultimately would spawn the cottage industry, which would be born in spite of the guild system during the late, yes, I'm saying the late mercantile feudal epoch, even though it was part of the late feudal era. Anywho, in the cottage industry, where knowledge and materials to produce commodities was being brought to the peasant families, <coughs> It allowed the merchants to over over time to overcome the very guilds that they were struggling against in the very beginning of setting up the cottage industry and to later supplant them with manufacturing proper. Thus journeymen, handicraftsmen, and previous guild workers along with their peasant counterparts were being converted en masse to manufacturing workers that later became pearls as manufacturing became full-blown factories and the factory system developed to overcome skilled laborers and to hire more hands up to, to up production while increasing the bourgeoisie's bargaining, bargaining power against the working class, that being because there's a larger labor pool or a larger army reserve army of laborers that, that the working class had a less powerful bargaining chip to struggle against the bourgeoisie to fight for better reforms and better demands and a better future for themselves in spite of the bourgeoisie's bourgeoisie themselves. But more upon that later. Of course this all happened as I mentioned earlier as free capital was finally taking its role in society and inserted itself to prevent society to revert back to a simpler time that would stunt its growth and prevent human society being dialectically in motion in the path that it was currently in. If capital hadn't done it, entirely different history of course. Meanwhile, steam power became the prevailing mode of production and locked capitalism 
as a universal into place after capitalism came into being for those societies that it had for a while, even before the economic mode of production existed. Without either free capital becoming capital, and without steam power becoming the prevailing mode of production, after water power was becoming less and less useful, industrialization, industrializing countries, and the Industrial Revolution, for all these countries that were going through industrialization, would be stunted, their production would be capped, and human history would be halted, and develop, and this, <coughs> these all contri contributing factors would continually develop intensely antagonistic contradictions that would force a country into turmoil, if not resolved by bloodshed, like a civil war for that matter, or reforms against the past, reforms against a past social order that was still clinging on for its dear life. But let's end the section right here, as I want to get into other topics, and again, another topic for another time.